Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fazal's Molecular Machines Group. Uh, welcome everyone who's here with us in the seminar. And then for those of you who will be watching this later online, uh, thanks so much for joining. Um, before we head uh, off with today's presentation, I just want to make people aware for a minute that Vision Weekend is coming up, which is Foresight's annual member gathering. Um, and this will happen uh, this year again for the second time uh, in Europe and in the uh, in the US. And so you can pick your poison. And some people also go to both of these events. Uh, in a nutshell, what is Vision Weekend? Um, it is the part where we try to bring the top folks across our technical programs together um, to really take stock of what happened that year uh, in science and technology and how can we make these features go well. So if you click on any of them, uh, all of these bumble out uh, to various different speakers across different tracks. And so if you're interested in how your specific area of interest is also impacted by other technologies, then this could be an interesting one for you to attend. Uh, lots of foresighters will be there, lots of folks in the Molecular Machines group also coming, um, but those are roughly the venues. Um, and this is in November and in December in France and in San Francisco. Um, okay, so that's just to make you guys aware of this. I'm gonna share the Vision Weekend here in the chat as well. Uh, if you would like to join and you're part of this group, just apply, there are tickets available um, and they are free. And some of them are even on a subsidized application where we try to provide you to travel. So um, this is definitely something that uh, I think members in this group can benefit from. Okay, cool. So uh, without further ado, I am terribly excited uh, for today's talk. Um, uh, we are trying uh, out a different format, which uh, involves a little bit more of an interview process at this stage as well, because I know from feedback forms that many people would like a little bit more of an actual like back and forth and introduction. And so the algorithm will be that we'll have a short presentation. And I will start with a few interview questions and then you can interrupt me anytime by asking your questions, uh, which, um, uh, which is definitely what we want to get to. Okay, wonderful. So today uh, we are joined uh, by Grace Hahn. I'm really, really happy to have you here, Grace. Uh, thank you so much for joining on such short notice. Uh, and you'll today be discussing harnessing photo-induced phase transition of organic materials for energy storage. I'm going to share more about your bio here in the chat. Um, but um, yeah, I'm really, really flattered and honored that uh, you, may, you said yes to this invitation. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Amar and Cole, for making uh, the introduction happen. And um, I'll be in the chat if there's any questions. And uh, from now on, the stage is yours. And really happy to have the discussion afterwards. All right. Thanks so much for invitation, Allison. And then I'm really thrilled to um, be able to share uh, our work with you here today. Um, let me try to share the screen. Is that all right? And okay. Um, little disclaimer. Um, so this is very similar to my uh, one of my very recent talk at ACS. So I have to apologize to Amar. There's not much <laughs> change from uh, two weeks ago, but uh, okay, let's start. Um, all right. So um, so yeah, in our group at Brandeis, we are studying um, uh, the photo switchable materials, and in particular, uh, how to utilize them to harness uh, the solar energy. Um, and before I start, okay, let's uh, go over the uh, people who actually did the work. So uh, these are current members of the group. And also, I, I really want to highlight our amazing collaborators, including uh, Ivana Paramian and Matt Thokcher, uh, who uh, have, you know, synthesized amazing photo switches that uh, we have, um, you know, really evaluated as the energy storage materials and funding sources. Okay, so we are um, light responsive materials research group. So we design, um, you know, responsive materials that incorporate these uh, photo switches. Uh, for example, azobenzene. It's very simple isomerization. I don't have to uh, go over this uh, in detail in this group. So we are utilizing the photo switches in the materials to be able to control various properties of materials. Uh, for example, the photon and thermal energy storage in them. Um, the um, translocation of the biomolecules or small molecule through the nanocores and the assemblies of biomaterials. And we also control uh, and recycle the various um, 
valuable molecules, for example, organic catalysts in solutions. Uh, so to, in today's talk, I'd like to highlight some of our recent uh, effort in um, controlling the energy storage in these uh, photosynthesis over three years. So, um, so the title had the phase change of materials. So I have to first emphasize why we study the phase transition of the materials. Uh, so there's really urgent need for the emission-free fuels uh, to reduce the uh, you know, emission of the carbon dioxide as well as the um, air pollution, particularly the indoor air pollution that's caused by you know, burning, combusting these solid fuels uh, uh, that really um, causes about 3.8 million premature deaths per year, which is more than AIDS and malaria combined. So there's really uh, a big motivation for us to think of a new way to provide um, clean emission-free thermal energy, uh, possibly by recycling like renewable energy sources like the sun. Uh, these are the state-of-the-art phase change over three years for organic and inorganic types. Uh, so these um, are showing various ranges of the melting point and then large quantity of the latent heat that can be stored in the liquid. So ideally, this is the picture that we are envisioning. Um, so we have the solid state phase change materials at the room temperature. I uh, would just take it outside under the sun, let it absorb the solar heat and it will melt at this melting point and form the liquid, which is containing um, the latent heat. And, uh, you know, after the sunset, temperature drops and this will gradually um, crystallize and release the stored latent heat. So this is the ideal picture, but of course, this is not really uh, happening these days because this process is very entirely passive, meaning the phase transition is only dependent on the temperature change of the surroundings. So even after um, storing the large quantity of latent heat in the liquid phase, um, temperature drops and then it just spontaneously uncontroll uncontrollably crashes out and releases that uh, energy. So we don't uh, have any means to actively control the heat storage time and when to release this energy. So we are trying to address this problem of the heat storage. Uh, by utilizing the photo switches. So you're looking at the simple azobenzene structure, which has the planar uh, E isomeric form um, at the ground state when it absorbs uh, the photons. Typically in the UV range, uh, it undergoes the structural change to this nonpolar, uh, sorry, nonplanar and more polar structure, Z isomer. Uh, and then when you uh, shine different wavelengths of light, for example, in the visible range, uh, it undergoes a reverse isomerization to the planar E form. So typically when we design these um, you know, phase transition, optically controllable phase transition three years, we put the alkyl chains here uh, at the parallel position of the isobenzene so that initially, uh, because the isobenzene part is planar, uh, everything will align in, in this parallel fashion, making very nice crystalline phase material. Uh, and we let it absorb the heat from the surroundings or solar heat. Uh, so it will raise the temperature of both the melting point and make this uh, into liquid phase. Uh, and then we uh, irradiate it with the UV light, which will make it undergo the transistor isomerization. To, the, uh, to this vent form. At this point, it's here, uh, the homogeneous liquid phase. And because this D isomer is more bulky and also more polar than the E isomer, it has the melting point that is much lower than the initial melting point of the E isomer. So we can actually cool it down well below the initial melting point and still preserve the liquid phase. So this is stable form that stores the latent heat. Um, so we can release the, the heat now by triggering it uh, with the visible light irradiation, which will revert the cis to trans uh, isomerization and induce the crystallization. So we are um, able to control the thermal energy storage and release using optical um, uh, stimulus. So in this process, we are uh, storing two uh, types of energy. First is what we see here as delta H uh, sub M. So this is latent heat that's involved in the solid liquid phase transition. 
and also the isomer adjacent energy that's delta H sub iso. So that's intrinsic energy difference between the ground state E isomer and the metastable Z isomer, which is actually illustrated better in this energy diagram. Um, so you have the planar uh, E isomer, which has the lower energy state when you um, make the Z confirmation because of this intramolecular CH, CH steric hindrance. Uh, its energy is higher than that of the ground state. So it becomes metastable. But because of the presence of the energy barrier here, uh, this metastable form doesn't readily revert to the ground state and it has certain level of half-life. And what's important here is the gap between E and Z isomer. Uh, so that's the isomer adjacent energy. So even without the phase transition, we can store the photon energy in the um, very strained chemical bonds and upon triggering with either some activation to overcome this barrier or shining visible light, we can uh, revert this process and uh, release the heat. And we are combining this process and the phase transition between solid and liquids to really boost the total energy storage density. Uh, but the challenges of the uh, exobenzene um, derivative is first, the activation barrier is pretty low. So um, even you know in dark, this e Z isomer can spontaneously or gradually revert to E isomer uh, over time. So uh, this really limits the heat storage time to about 10 hours, which is pretty short. Uh, so it gradually it goes back to the E solid. Second challenge is that the UV activated Z isomer, this still has the melting point slightly higher than the room temperature, which means we cannot store uh, the, the liquid state or the latent heat in a stable fashion under ambient conditions. So in order to overcome these challenges, we are um, we set out to design new types of molecular switches. So first is uh, through the collaboration with Matt Fulcher and Imperial College. Uh, my student Mike uh, found that by substituting one phenyl group in the azobenzene structure by the paranzo ring, uh, I can really increase the half-life of the Z isomer uh, quite drastically from one day for azobenzene to 10 days to even 46 years, depending on the substitution patterns. And computations, uh, predict that it, this is due to the favorable intramolecular CH pi interaction between this hair, uh, this five membered ring CH bond and the, the phenyl group. So because it this stabilizes the, the energy level of the Z isomer, you can increase the energy barrier for the thermal reversion. Uh, when we have the ortho substituent, which is methyl, this induces intramolecular steric hindrance, so makes um, the Z isomer more twisted in, as opposed to T-shaped structure in this case. Uh, and this um, is reflected in the much shorter half-life of this derivative with the ortho method substitution uh, compared to others. So what Mike did was to attach the long phenyl, uh, long uh, IQ chains to this aromatic uh, moieties. And this is the typical different scanning calorimetry uh, thermal tetrajation uh, that you hope to see, which is the maximal uh, you know, differences between the E isomer and Z isomer in terms of their crystallinity. So first uh, here, what we are looking at is the crystalline E isomer that shows clear melting point and then uh, upon cooling, it shows clear crystallization point. So that's you know, shows that E isomers are very, very crystalline. Um, um, uh, on the other hand, the Z isomer doesn't show any of those sharp peaks. Instead, it has a glass transition at sub-zero temperature. So it shows that the Z isomer, on the other hand, uh, it's stable liquid over a really wide range of temperature from minus 40 to 80 degrees Celsius which is also attributed to the T-shaped uh, Z conformation uh, in despite the intramolecular CH pi interaction. So um, the T-shaped structure really hinders the packing of the photochromes in the condensed phase. So it really uh, facilitates the formation of the liquid phase. 
So the energy source cycle is almost identical from the ATO bending derivative, except that um, the Z isomer is very stable liquid, even at sub-zero temperature. So we can actually cool it down to minus 30 and still keep the liquid phase and then uh, trigger the heat release uh, using visible light. So new properties that we have found is first, yeah, heat storage and release uh, at sub-zero temperature, which is very important for certain applications, including de-icing, uh, defrosting and the winter, and the storage time of the liquid and the laser heat extended from hours in the azobenzene case to several weeks uh, in the azo um, pyrazol uh, derivatives because of that increased activation barrier for the thermal reversion. But the remaining challenges, uh, the, one of the most prominent one is the UV act requirement for the UV activation. So for both azobenzene derivatives and aerosopyrazoles, the initial UV um, irradiation is necessary to generate this Z isomer, but UV is only less than 4% of the solar spectrum. So it really hinders the direct furnacing of the solar irradiation uh, using these kind of materials. So we wanted to extend the, uh, at the absorption uh, profile of these switches by functionalization. So um, this shows that uh, by functionalizing the ortho positions of azobenzene, uh, the principle that were um, demonstrated by Stephen Act and Andrew Lee and uh, a lot of pioneers. So what it does is to um, redshift the n 2 pi absorption band of the E isomer of the azobenzene. Uh, this is because of the intramolecular interaction between the ortho substituent and the azo group, which really raises the non-bonding orbital of the azo. So we can actually separate these two uh, into pi star transition bands between Z and E. So now instead of addressing uh, this area, the UV, to make Z, we can actually um, shine visible light at a longer wavelengths uh, to address this really tail part of the n pi star band. So by changing the substituent on the azo ortho um, positions, we can uh, make this new photo switches that can be uh, can absorb green to red range of the visible light to switch to Z isomer. So which means now we can actually harness both solar heat and solar photons um, to um, make this liquid phase. That which stores energy and we can uh, then trigger the release of the energy. Um, so this uh, just shows the similar DSC uh, features, meaning that um, these orthofunctionalized azobenzene still show drastic uh, phase differences between the E isomer and Z isomer, which is very desired property. So now we can um, put these um, E isomer powder into the greenhouse to so let it absorb the solar heat and we place the band pass filter uh, above this powder, crystalline powder of E isomer. So we allow the only the desired wavelengths of photons to come in and switch the isomer from E to Z. So uh, we don't have to now rely upon any artificial UV lamps or LEDs. So everything is just spontaneous. Um, so the the E to Z isomer radiation, as well as the phase transition from the crystalline to liquid phase. Uh, and then we can trigger the reversion by either shining um, blue LED or the solar air radiation through the blue band pass filter. So these are the real um, the setups that we have chosen. So um, at the end, um, this is a slightly larger scale experiment. We just have the powder in the cube bag. We just wrap it with the Green transparency, which access the uh, band pass filter. So this um, spontaneously make the liquid and the isomers at the same time. We can recycle the material and then recycle the energy. Uh, and what's really striking is that these materials um, can absorb very low irradiance light in the range of one to two megawatt per square centimeter. And uh, I can also recycle photons from the indoor lighting. So this derivative in particular has absorption band that uh, really overlaps with the emission spectrum 
of the indoor floors and light bulbs. So this means that um, they can just sit around in the room and just recycle uh, the wasted photon from the indoor lighting. So these are uh, potential applications of these materials. Uh, still the remaining challenge is that uh, some of these designer molecules have hard time reverting back to the EI summer uh, through photochemical triggering. So that's um, well, well illustrated here in this work. So this area is a parcel derivative with the fluorine groups uh, exhibited 40, 60 years of half-life. So it's very nice, stable Z isomer. So uh, switching E to Z is very easy under the UV light. But then photochemical reversion is very limited. It's incomplete. Only 46% um, can revert back to the E isomer. Um, thermal reversion at the room temperature takes forever, like 14 years. So this redox activation has been suggested and actually demonstrated in this variety of pioneering work by uh, Robert Klein and St Stefanet. Uh, they demonstrated this principle in the solution state uh, in the presence of solvent and the electrolyte. So basically um, you can either oxidize or reduce it, um, the photochromes to facilitate and also complete the reversion. Uh, but then uh, in order to apply this principle in the energy applications, we have to demonstrate this in the condensed phase uh, because in the presence of solvent electrolyte, the energy release is actually just used to heat up the surroundings like solvent. So we, we are not actually uh, able to observe, observe like a uh, large uh, degree of temperature, temperature increase uh, when the energy release happens. So we are trying to do that. And first, uh, let's look at uh, the, the mechanism. So when you switch E to Z using UV light and apply electrical bias, this is electrochemical triggering. So you can either oxidize or reduce the Z isomer to make the radical cations or anions, uh, which will have a lower activation barrier for thermal reversion because the radicals will uh, reduce the double bond character of the, the azo group. So it uh, enables them to uh, rotate and invert more easily back to the ground state E. And this radical species can be transferred to um, Z isomers in proximity. So this is actually electrocatalytic mechanism. And we have measured the thermal reversion barrier um, for the radical species, radical Z. Uh, it actually got reduced quite significantly from the neutral species. So we demonstrated this in the condensed space as well. So you, we melted and made the condensed film of the E isomer between the, the two glass slide coated with the ITO. So it's a conductive transparent oxide and irradiated it with UV to make the Z isomer and then apply the bias and observe that electrochemically we can trigger the reversion. And we have made these three derivatives uh, that share the common photochromic core. So that's era is a parazole, uh, which had you know, particular difficulty in photochemical reversion. We chose them uh, to demonstrate this principle. Uh, so what's changing is their conductivity level. So this is neutral. This is uh, higher, higher conductivity than these two. And what we measured was the efficiency of reversion. So every injected charge from this electrode can convert up to 143 molecules of the isomer back to the isomer. So this is also supporting the electrocatalytic mechanism. And overall, uh, when we tested these in solution state, we have observed that the efficiency of reversion is at least about an order of magnitude lower in solution as opposed to in condensed space. So that shows that um, the proximity of the, the photochromic isomers in per volume is really important for efficient transfer of the radical to the neutral molecules. So it enables the you know, efficient electrocatalytic reversion. Uh, since these are all in condensed fields, the viscosity of materials are also important in, in this reversion. 
Um, so this one in particular, in the middle is ionic crystalline. So it's very, very sticky. The viscosity is extremely high. Uh, in this case, we, uh, we saw incomplete reversion because of simply just really large steric hindrance between the orocrons. All right, so last part, uh, this is a recent collaboration with Ivan, Spru, and Dartmouth. So we want to really um, expand the scope of the uh, photo switch that can be used for energy storage. So a lot of people study norbordadienes and azobenzene or azarenes and um, a few others, but um, we really need to diversify the scope of the switches. So hydrogens really caught our eyes because it's really, uh, it has amazing photo uh, physical properties. Um, so it's bistable between Z and E isomer. So now the Z confirmation is ground state in case of hydrogens and we can make the E isomer. Uh, switching is very facile and complete uh, for both directions. Quantum meals are very good. Uh, they also can switch in solid as well, which is different from the uh, most of the azobenzene cases, but the, um, the potential of these hydrogens um, and storing photon energy has not been had, had not been determined because of two reasons. Uh, first, the complications predicted that the energy gap, the intrinsic energy gap between the C ground state and the E uh, in a single state, uh, to be very small, so very insignificant, uh, which makes sense because the metastable E isomer in this case doesn't have significant intra molecular um, strain as opposed to the azobenzene, which did have that uh, CH uh, steric hindrance. Uh, another one is that uh, the activation barrier for the reversion is very large in case of the hydrogens. So uh, after making the E isomer, if you want to try to thermally isomerize it back, so you just have to heat it up then what you see is thermal decomposition first before they have a chance to switch back to the Z isomer. So how we address this problem is to cyclize uh, the hydrozone. So by putting the tether between these two parts, we were able to uh, induce more intramolecular strains, which destabilize the E isomeric form, uh, therefore, this, this level goes up, so increase the gap between the ground state and the metastable energy uh, levels. So these are the, the scope that we have explored. So on top, you're looking at the acyclic hydrozones. They do not have any strain in the E isomer. Therefore, uh, the half-life of that E is extremely large, um, long, like up to 10,000 years. Um, in contrast, the cyclic E isomers have larger strain in the cyclic E when it undergoes the C to E isomerization, it induces the strain, which lowers the activation barrier for reversion and also shortens the half-life. So this is actually much shorter than the acyclic one. Uh, in condensed phase, they exhibit very diverse um, transitions depending on the substituent you put on the photoprom. So these short um, uh, kiloester groups uh, make the hydrogen set just switch um, back and forth in the crystalline phase. And when you attach this branch like kill chain, uh, they make the liquid phase of the Z and E isomers both. And then we were able to measure the isomerization energy. So the gap, uh, which is very, very small as predicted by computation. Uh, but when we attach the, the tether to make the cyclic form, um, these two compounds with the slightly shorter tethers show uh, the solid, solid transition, but the delta H total, so energy storage uh, is extremely increase as, as compared to uh, the acyclic form. And lastly, these two hydrogens with slightly longer tether, they do exhibit the solid liquid phase transition as well uh, when they undergo the isomerization. So um, the total energy storage uh, in the liquid state of the E isomer is 
up to 72 kilojoules per mole, which is actually very similar to the state-of-the-art azobenzin or azoarene compounds uh, that also undergo the liquid solid phase transition. So this is the result of the storing both latent heat and isomerization energy. Uh, the only difference is the breakdown of the total energy storage in the hydrogen zone. So you notice that the isomerization energy is tw only 25 kilojoules per mole. And the majority of the contribution came from the latent heat storage, which makes sense uh, because intrinsically, the ZE isomeric uh, forms of the hydrogens are very close in terms of energy level, but it is really the large London dispersion forces um, of the solid Z isomer, which uh, increase the latent heat uh, storage and therefore contribute to the large uh, energy storage density of the of these systems. Yeah, so um, to summarize, uh, um, we are really changing the molecular designs to fine tune the intra and intramolecular interactions between the photo switches, and that allows us to really tune different properties um, of the switches that are relevant to the solar energy. Uh, harvesting, including the wavelengths of light that they absorb, and phase transition temperature and enthalpy, and how we trigger uh, the the heat release, and how efficiently we can release the energy. Uh, also, we have been exploring um, different switches beyond the azobenzins, and over this um, uh, symposium uh, or workshop, um, I was asked to pose the you know, prominent challenges in the field. So I would say for uh, for these types of um, switches, uh, in order for them to work, uh, yeah, work in the large scale devices, uh, they need to be improved, particularly uh, in their uh, optical properties. So um, many of them have very short light fetching depths uh, in the condensed states uh, and they remain in micron uh, range uh, that's because of the large spectral overlap between two isomeric forms. For example, this air azoparazol, uh, the E isomer has this like, large uh, pi to pi transition and to pi transition. Um, Z has a slightly different shape, but still they have significant overlap in both areas. So when we um, uh, predict the static light penetration depth through the condensed space, it shows that. Um, uh, only like 50 micro uh, meter of the condensed phase films can be switched completely at the UV range, and it's slightly larger uh, for the visible range, but still it's not significant. So, in, if we want to build a device that is very uh, thick and large, uh, the light penetration has to be at least centimeters range or you know meters range, but that's really uh, the intrinsic problems with this switching. So um, that also leads to the low speed of photo switching and phase transition. So it takes hours to switch them, uh, even you know in the very thin samples. So we really need to think about new molecular designs that could uh, resolve these challenges. So I like to hope. Uh, I hope to hear some great advice and insights from you guys. And I'd like to thank you again, Alison, and for the invitation and for your attention. Wonderful, thank you so, so much, Grace. Um, that was uh, really, really great. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you guessed five virtual clapping hands. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, I think that, uh, you know, um, one thing we would love to see from this group. Uh, oh, we already have a, a raised question. So I guess uh, I will save my questions for later. And we're just going to do a few participant questions now. So uh, Christian, take it away. Um, could you give us an idea of what the energy density of um, this is? I have no way to calibrate this. Yeah, energy density of the, the typical switches with the phase transition. 
Yeah. So uh, yep. uh, what we care about is uh, gravimetric energy density. So for the applications, it really matters how much uh, energy we can store per volume or per mass. So the um, the state of the art uh, materials have about 300 joule per gram. So that's the gravimetric energy density. And that's actually comparable to the um, uh, energy storage capacity of the sodium ion batteries. Uh, not, not as high as lithium ion batteries, but um, if we uh, think about this material as like organic, uh, you know, derived very cheap materials, we can easily, you know, synthesize in large volume and then the cost will be uh, much less than the lithium or sodium ion battery. So I do think that it has um, some potential for commercialization. Okay. So, so there, thank you for that comparison. So sodium ion batteries, these are comparable to that. Mm -hmm. um, is what, what do you think is the potential for something like this, where you have a conformational change storing energy? What sort of, what do you think is the upper limit? Upper limit? Well, upper limit, um, there are a few things that can increase the energy density from here. So one um, is the uh, like types of the bond, bonds being broken and, and made. So what we are looking at is just pi bond uh, being broken and made. So th the energy is limited to that. So there are different types of switches that are um, rather utilizing the sigma bond um, opening and, and closing. So in that case, the energy storage is more substantial, but it also comes with different challenges, for example, for the degradation and et cetera. So azobenzene has the advantage of being very robust and um, it doesn't really photodegrade very easily. Um, so that, and also I think it's not quite the what's limiting the, the energy storage density, but in terms of efficiency, I think uh, the quantum yield of switches have to be improved quite significantly. So these are remaining um, uh, about like 10 to 40% for azobent for the forward and backward uh, isomerization. But there are other switches that are known out there that shows the quantum yield as high as 90 something percent, but it also comes with challenge, which is very short half-life. So we really need to find the, the balance between um, those two extremes. Um, so yeah, so those are the important challenges, but it's partly solved. So that's why I didn't really put in here. Um, yeah, does that um, answer your questions? Yes, thank you very much. Wonderful. Okay, press on down. Uh, Thomas, you're next. Um, in case it's useful, feel free to provide some context on your background uh, if it's relevant for the question. Uh, and definitely no pressure if not. Good. Um, uh, good to see you, Grace. Uh, and uh, fantastic talk. I really, really uh, like seeing this stuff. Um, so uh, I, I had a couple of questions, um, and one of them uh, has to do with something you mentioned in passing, um, which was that uh, with, with hydrozones, um, uh, you mentioned that without the greenhouse effect, you could irradiate your your system uh, in in the solid state uh, and get isomerization, um, which is really interesting to me. It just seems uh, it, it seems like there would be a lot of kind of kinetic barriers to that associated with crystal lattice energies and stuff like this. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, you've you've undoubtedly considered this a lot more rigorously than I have just now in this moment. Uh, what are the the sort of factors involved that must be overcome by uh, the like irradiated energy um, to switch a material out of its solid state into a, a different isomeric form? Yeah, so to, to, just to reiterate your question, I guess you're asking is um, for most of the azobenzene that I presented today have to be slightly heated off first to gain yes. that confirmation of freedom but in case of hydrogens, it's uh, switching even in crystalline state at the room temperature, which is very intriguing, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, this is really one of the reasons why we have selected hydrogens. I um, mean, Ivan is also like, Ivan is a much like um, better person probably to answer these questions, but we do have a um, different system that we have uh, made and, um, you know, it's under review, so we haven't really put it in here, but uh, it, it's also an azo arene system, azo heteroarene system, but they don't have to be heated up 
to higher temperature, it switches back and forth between crystalline state and liquid state at the room temperature under different wavelengths of light. So what we can um, learn from that system is that the, the degree of the pi pi interaction between the photochromes in the crystalline state is what's governing um, the switchability in the crystalline state. So what's different in that system, the, our most recent system that can switch at room temperature is that we have some uh, ortho functional groups that are methyl groups. So instead of um, changing the, the pair positions, so we are really putting something on the ortho positions. I think that's not very significantly large, but enough to reduce that the, the pipe interaction that's really driving the crystalline uh, crystallinity and also hinders the rotation and inversion of age of benzene in the crystalline state. But just uh, giving a little bit of the alkyl functional groups that reduces pipe interaction, we were able to switch it. So we, we are actually um, trying to understand this better by changing the functional, functional groups around the, the heteroaromatic structures as well as the you know, aromatics. Um, so I think that, that that's what's uh, happening. I, I don't really know, honestly, too much about the hydrozones. Um, so, but in, in the previous system that Ivan has studied, um, these small acyclic hydrozones can switch back and forth in the crystal state, which is very interesting. Oh, fully in the crystal states, fully solid state as amorizations. I don't know. Very cool. <laughs> so Thomas, just to chime in, Grace already gave the answer. It has to do with crystal packing and it also has to do with the switching mechanism. So in azobenzene, usually you have a rotation around the nitrogen nitrogen double bond that requires right. a lot of volume, right? So if the if the if the molecules are packing very tightly, you don't have that volume and space to do the switching. In hydrazone, the switching we think is basically is an inversion at the nitrogen nitrogen bond, basically carbon bond. So that changes the the free volume you need. And moreover, the hydrazones in general, depending on the derivatives, don't pack very tightly. So we have free space and a different mechanism for inversion that basically allows for these to be solid state uh, switchable systems as well. Anyway, we have a, a number of papers about this, mostly the JAX 2019 explaining all of these things based on crystal structures. Got it, thank you, appreciate it. Very cool. Um, yeah, feel free to drop the papers here in case you have them handy. Otherwise, I'll, I'll try my best to also <laughs> uh, do some Googling. Uh, Amar, um, if you'd like to chime in, that'd be wonderful. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Grace. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I had um, a question that was inspired by the um, last image you showed with the, um, the penetration depth of light. Um, and it's because I've become aware of the role of triplet sensitizers. Mm -hmm. to facilitate the cis to trans uh, isomerization and that those those triplet sensitizers, for example, porphyrins, but there are, are others, of course, can be there at a, at a lower amount operating in more of a catalytic sense. Um, and of course, they are often shifted um, down into that more um, transparent window uh, for the main... Uh, um, you know, enthalpy carrying uh, uh, um, changes from the azo groups. Is there any role for those that type of triplet sensitization in some of the schemes that you've been thinking about? Yes, um, actually, we have ongoing um, collaboration with the Rockford Lines group. So you remember the the cages that I, I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah. It allows the the, the sensitizers. Um, to be really trapped with the trans azobenzene only so that there's efficient like sensitization of the trans so they can switch to cis and it leaves the cage and the new, new trans can come in. And so that's, uh, yeah, definitely exciting uh, new yeah, avenue. So it, we actually have tried the sensitization idea a few years back, but it didn't really work because it was primarily switching um, the cis back to the trans. So not the, and that's usually not the, the problem for energy storage, uh, except for, you know, those specific designs that have hard time for the chemically reverting. 
but most of the times it is the UV driven charging, which we, we needed to address, but that was very difficult because the sensitization more uh, favoring the reversion. But with the, the kind of sterically, um, you know, yeah, uh, well designed pages, yeah, it's possible. So we are working on it. So, so uh, you're telling me that it, it, in, in reality, you would rather be sensitized from trans to cis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I don't know if you've got into the conversation with Rafal, um, but uh, it, it obviously I'm exploring this as well for my own reasons. Um, is there any scholarship that people have done on the reason why um, it's much more likely for the cis through the triplets to go to trans than, than from the trans to the cis? Because in the same way that uh, photoisomerization efficiencies, rates, and so forth can be tuned up with covalent judicious bond. Yeah, I, I bet. Yeah, I, I think if you can, like, you know, instead of printing them. So first of all, I think to uh, answer your question, uh, I don't really know the the fundamental reasons why it prefers to sensitize the, the cis rather than trans. But empirically, um, the I think the quantum yield of the switching is higher for the reversion uh, rather than the trans-cis isomerization. Uh, and about your covalent bonding idea, yes, yeah, even though you're not using cage, if you can somehow, you know, put the switch close to the sensitizer uh, in the trans state, I think, yeah, it will sensitize trans rather than cis. But um, yeah, yeah that, that's, that really requires elaborate design, I guess. A bit of computational work was pretty hardcore computational work as well, I'd say. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Grace. Okay, wonderful. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to raise your hand or drop them in the chat in case you're not in a good audible environment. Um, I will continue to ask um, the questions that are kind of like of foresight, uh, you know, big uh, relevance until you guys stop me with your questions. So just an invitation. Um, to still keep asking questions. So I think I'm gonna, uh, uh, I'm shutting you down. Um, so like a few things, you know, that are of like close interest to foresight is if there's any specific undervalued areas for progress. And I know that in your last slide, you already kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm just like curious to hear, you know, for someone new entering the field, is there a particular area that, you know, you wanna draw people's attention to? Are there specific undervalued uh, challenges that people can take on um, that, you know, may come into the field. Yeah, so um, like like I said in the last slide, um, scaling um, up the system is really a prominent challenge, not because it's synthetically difficult. Uh, actually, it's very cheap and easy to make a lot of switches like this. But once we make very, very thick sample condensed space, um, it takes forever to switch them, um, or only the the surface of the thick films or the thick powder, you know, solid can be switched because the uh, you know instead of light will switch the first layer of it, but then that switched um, Z isomer, for example, is still absorbing that instead of light. It's not zero absorption, so because of that attenuation of light absorption, uh, not the entire bulk sample can be switched. So uh, this can be addressed by two different approaches, I think. One is to intrinsically change the, the photochromic structure such that two isomeric forms will have very orthogonal uh, absorption spectra. Two is engineering approach, which is to really um, facilitate the convection or diffusion of the you know, top layer so it goes away uh, as soon as it's converted and the, it exposes the new unswitched um, materials in, in the, at the bottom. So these two uh, yeah, requires attention, I think. Uh, not a lot of people are looking into this problem. Um, so yeah, so that, that's another reason why we are focusing on the new switches other than the ASA arenas. Still looking. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see, maybe you've done some outsourcing <laughs> uh, through this. Um, there, there's, there, there are a ton of like, I guess, more younger researchers that 
often like ask me, uh, yeah, what could I take on in the field of molecular machines? I'm like, well, I'm not the person to ask, but I will ask for you. So, uh, so, so let's see. Um, then, you know, I think more of a long-term question is, you know, we, uh, at Foresight, we look a little bit of, also over the horizon of the next five years or something. Uh, and I know that, you know, researchers hate to speculate, uh, but uh, with that um, kind of like warning in place, can you give like a rough outlook of what you hope um, to be potentially possible if this research goes well, like, you know, what, what could we potentially expect in like, you know, five years or a little longer? I think anything like past the 10 year mark uh, is a little bit too, too long, but like, you know, why is this interesting um, on the long run? Yeah, I think it's definitely fundamentally interesting. That's what's really drawn to uh, me to this area. Just, uh, just, just fine tuning the structure a little bit with certain function groups, certain heteroaromatic rings, you can really drastically change their photostriching properties, their thermal property, their phase property. And these are all very attractive. But in the end, these, this area is called MOST, molecular solar thermal energy um, compound, storage compound. So we really hope to see um, the, the large scale demonstration and actual uh, impl um, implication of these. Uh, new properties. So one thing that I could imagine is um, that actually two things. One is to uh, make devices that can uh, either supplement or replace the photovoltaics or solar water heating system that are uh, you know currently out there. So these are usually the you know black metal sheets that you mount on the top a uh, rooftop and then you absorb the solar energy and heat up the water and the hot water goes into your water tank. It can be stored, but you need the substantial uh, thermal insulation to be able to keep the the water tank hot. So, um, so that means we are relying upon the sensible energy storage in water, so the changing the temperature of the 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 fluid. But instead, if we have this uh, phase transition material that can be controllably uh, storing and releasing energy using the stimulus, we can uh, first. Um, you know, make it into the liquid phase in the ZI solid form, it's kind of locked with certain half-life, with a certain storage time. And then, uh, so it can be stored for like daily or seasonally until we trigger it to release heat. So it can be used towards domestic um, heating of the space, water and food, etc. So that's more like a larger scale stationary uh, application. Another one is for a smaller, I think more um, portable system, which is to um, to uh, warm up the frozen engine oil. So now I know everyone's switching to electrical car, but we have a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, gasoline cars as well, which operates with engine. And the problem is in the cold climb, we have the engine oil uh, you know, a problem in the cold days, sub zero temperatures, engine oil gels up, and then we cannot start the car, or we have to uh, really heat up the, the the frozen engine oil using electrical heating. So it's dual heating, so it's wasting a lot of electricity. So uh, instead of putting the you know um, heat pads or you know dipstick heater, we can think of uh, utilizing these. A trailer that can recycle the extra heat from the running engine when you're driving and when you come home, uh, this liquid will be, you know, staying as liquid overnight because we have switched it. Uh, and in the morning when you need to drive out, you just have to trigger it, um, and it will release all the heat back to the frozen oil, so it can instantly get warmed up. And um, you know, you can you don't have to plug in your your car overnight. So these are uh, and there are like more you know, applications like, you know, integrating to your fabrics or garments or, you know, watches and a lot of different things can be possible because simply these are very uh, easy to make and very uh, not costly. Um, so, yeah, hopefully in five, 10 years and uh, <laughs> we'll be able to get there. Wow, very cool. Um, okay, um, maybe your last one for me is, um, you know, one thing that, I guess, you know, we are super interested in this, I, I guess, like navigating technologies also towards the more positive applications uh, and avoiding potential risks. And I think there's no better uh, people to ask about potential, um, you know, technological risks than uh, the people working on it. So are, are there, do you have any, um, you know, potential like traps in mind that 
or like any potential, you know, applications that we should like steer away from or like specific bits that we should take into account as we like move more and uh, down, down this direction. Yeah, sure. Um... I guess application wise, uh, first is biocompatibility. So I mentioned the, the integration to garment and et cetera. Uh, so these ASOs have been used in a lot of food coloring and a lot of dyes uh, for the fabrics as well, but their uh, biocompatibility or, you know, if they are carcinogenic or not have not been fully understood at the moment. So I think we have to probably test them more in order to really integrate it into like, um, a different application, the portable applications. The second one is the uh, flammability. So uh, this is a common problem of the organic phase change material, the traditional ones like paraffin as well. Um, so the paraffins, when they are molten, they can sometimes leak out of the container, then it causes fire. So, so I think that could be a potential risk, although the engineering of the, the you know device um, will be able to solve that. Um, so potentially we are envisioning that, okay, rather than using solid to liquid phase transition, what if we can have system like hydrogels, uh, that can switch between, um, solid phase, one solid phase to another solid phase, then, uh, we don't have the, the flammability or leakage problem. So that's another direction that we are actually, uh, exploring. Wow. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Wonderful. Last but not least, um, now that we've learned a little bit about your work, what can this group or someone perhaps even listening do if they want to help your work along? Like this is a shameless plug moment of um, are there any collaborations that you're seeking, um, you know, funding requests for specific projects? Um, you know, are you currently looking for postdocs or, you know, for for anyone to join your team, uh, uh, this, is, uh, oh, this is a good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I'm looking for a postdoc uh, who has expertise in chemical synthesis and hopefully a little bit of experience in, um, you know, dealing with optical materials and um, a little bit of background in photophysics. So yeah, definitely if you know any <laughs> good graduating PhD student, um, please uh, send them uh, this way. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So for anyone who is hearing this who roughly fits that category, I'm assuming that they can check out um, your page, which I shared here in the chat before, but uh, we will also have it in the YouTube description. Okay. Wonderful. Well, um, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Grace. Is there anything that we should have asked that we didn't get to any final bits that you want to share? Uh, sorry, is it? It again? Is there anything that uh, I should have asked or anything in the last minute uh, oh that you would like to share? Uh, yeah, I, th I think this, uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation again, because uh, this is a really group, great uh, group of experts uh, in the field. So I'm really happy to um, to meet um, this participant. I, I was actually reviewing some of the older videos as well. Uh, so I, I, I recognize some faces now. And I was actually uh, turning into this, uh, reading the chat. So what sort of questions are there uh, just now, but I'll, I'll have time to read this after after the, this meeting. But yeah, anyway, Wonderful. thank you so much, Alison. Thank you so, so much for joining. It was, uh, yeah, it was such a joy to have you on. Um, I shared a um, sheet right now, like a type form, if people want to nominate a future speaker as well, um, or a presentation topic, this can be more of an off the record brainstorm as well. Um, just to remind you of this and vision weekends coming up as well. So if you do want to meet in person, uh, that's a good one. Otherwise, watch out for your inbox for the next um, invitation for a future seminar. Thank you everyone for joining uh, so much and we'll be in touch uh, with follow-ups very soon. Thank you so much, Grace. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye everyone. <laughs>